gut feeling, then even if you don't know what it is, just follow it. Mm -hmm. Don't let anyone like gaslight you into being like, oh, no, no, it's fine. You'll be fine. Just like really listen to it. Yeah. 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 But it's tricky, right? Because then we also have in our biology just the flight or fight. Like yeah. there's also that thousands of years, something telling us we're unsafe that's actually fine, yeah. you know? Like it's tricky because the feeling of your intuition and the feeling of just like fight or flight telling you to run, even when it's maybe totally fine, they kind of exist in a very similar sensation and in a very similar place. So I think it does take a lot of time and uh, sensitivity to know what the difference is. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, the wisdom is in the discernment between yeah. whether to stay or whether to run. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I also I also feel like intuition goes beyond, and th this might just be my beliefs. I don't, I don't know how everyone likes to define it, but... I also feel like my intuition goes beyond just keeping me safe. Like, I don't know what it fully is or where it comes from. I know there is some science that backs that time is existing always, like all the past and all the future and now is existing in the same moment. So I, I don't know what my words are for it, but my intuition feels like it's beyond keeping me safe. Mm. It, it's some something that loves me. Yeah. Is like trying to get me to the good life. Yeah. Like something that loves me actually wants me to make the best decisions. Yeah. Um, that's how I try and look at it. And I don't know if it's me, my higher self, God, my ancestors. I, you know, I don't like need to define it. Yeah. I just like to imagine, I just like feel it. That like my intuition is actually some form of love guiding me. Yeah, that's such a nice way to put it. It's like making your mind your friend. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, let's be buddies. Let's not fight anymore. I mean, <laughs> we gotta try. <laughs> yeah. I, the, the alternative is so awful. Yeah. The alternative of feeling like your mind is against you. And I know people can feel that. I felt it at times. Like feeling like your mind is against you. Yeah. Feeling like your body is against you. Like it does take choice, work, compassion, support to actually decide. And over time, let me get my body on my side. Mm. Let me get on the side of my body. Let me get on the side of my mind. Let me get my mind on the side of me. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Oh my, a lot of my work is about about making the body the friend, about making the mm. mind the friend. And um, it's it's crazy. I hear a lot of people that pass through the school say, I would never speak to anyone else the way that I speak to different parts of my body or different parts of my mind or different experiences that I have. Why do I speak to myself that way? You know, and that's, it's so true. That internal voice can be so loud. And we would never, you know, say that unless it's maybe a keyboard warrior on, right, <laughs> on Instagram. Right, right, right. They might say it. But right. um, yeah, isn't that funny? Like there's such a different standard for ourselves sometimes right. than for the rest of Right, you would never world. tell a friend like, oh, you look so fucking ugly, yeah. you piece of shit. Yeah. You're so dumb, you idiot. <laughs> You made the wrong choice and that makes you bad forever. Like you would never say this to someone in your life. Yeah. You wouldn't even say it to a stranger. Yeah, um, yeah I feel like uh, one of the kind of easiest blockers to sensuality is just what do you say to yourself when you look in the mirror? Mm. What is those unconscious thoughts when you look in the mirror? And we all have them. Oh, my fucking hair is too whatever. My nose isn't right. My elbow is bony. Like yeah. we all have these things. And that's like an immediate disconnect to actually being in and on the side of your body. Absolutely. And so much of it can be that which is unspoken as well. So the one like the thoughts that actually come around that we hear are those which are kind of conscious. And then the ones that we don't hear are the ones that make us kind of hug in our belly when we don't realize through the day or like mm. scrunch up our shoulders mm. or maybe somebody said something in elementary school that we're still holding on to that we don't remember what it even was. But right. we, you know, there are all those other Right, but bits. it makes us yeah, tense like, without even realizing it. Yeah, like the bit underneath the iceberg, I think that really fascinates me because mm. do we have control over that? 
not consciously, but can we tap into it? I really think we can. Mm. I really think we can. Yeah, that's the tricky part. We we can see certain problems. Yeah. You talk about the iceberg. You can see the tip of the iceberg. Underneath is most of us. Like I feel like most of our patterns are subconscious mm. and unconscious. And can we access them? I have to hope so. I have to hope so too. Yeah. yeah. I think sometimes it takes kind of daily discipline, small yes. steps forward, repeated. I think sometimes it takes an extraordinary experience. Mm. Like sometimes it does take something kind of drastic to get us into our unconscious. I mean, even trauma, which is awful every time, uh, we're all gonna be traumatized in our lives, but sometimes the, the, the discomfort of trauma is so strong, it's getting in there somewhere deep and sometimes it actually can lead to a lot of clarity, even mm. if it comes with a lot of kind of side effects that are awful. Um, but I have found in times of extreme trauma, there have been moments where it's like life gets real clear. Yeah. Because I'm so uncomfortable. I have no capacity for anything that isn't kind of like truth. Yeah. Yeah. When you're at rock bottom, there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Things get very clear. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you have to find a way. You have to find a way. And your body will, your body is built for survival. So it will find that way. Yeah. Mm. And our bodies are also built, which I'm sure is what you teach at your school. Our bodies are built for more than survival. Yeah. They're be built for beauty and connection <laughs> yeah. and intimacy and like yeah. fucking healing. Yeah. Like, my goodness. During the pandemic, I, I learned more than ever. I've, I've known I love people my whole life. And like, this goes very beyond sexual intimacy, but like, in the pandemic, I, I was going crazy without touch mm. and without looking in someone's eyes. I had my, my roommate who I love dearly um, and we were at least looking at each other and talking, but we weren't cuddling, you know, yeah. my, my boy Theo, we weren't, <laughs> we weren't cuddling and, you know, rubbing each other's feet every night. Um, but, uh, but like, man, that time w was so hard and so illuminating to like we are here as humans to connect with one another yeah. and like it's essential yeah it's absolutely. essential it's non-negotiable is what i've discovered yeah absolutely and i think touch is one of those senses that has been really demonized actually yeah um and so sometimes it's it can be for some people it's their own touch on their own body and kind of actually really fully experiencing their own touch but also receiving touch from the same gender is like, oh no, no, I can't touch a bro or like, right. you know, it, but it's- It's a thing. It's a, it is a, oh, thing. It's a thing. It is a thing yeah. and it's like, but we are such sensate beings that like, does it really matter? Like if yeah. it's, does it all, does touch always have to be sexual? Like right. if touch is such an important part of connection and living and healing, then right. like, it's really nice to just hug also. Yeah, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. It doesn't a nice need to be, hug. Yeah. yeah. Touch doesn't always need to be sexual is what I'm saying. Right, Yeah. right. And it can still be just, I don't know, I found it to be super vital. I'm pretty like touchy-feely, so yeah. I, uh, I learned that I need it. And I think a lot of people do. There are times where I'm going through something and it, and it, and it seems like I'm just spinning mentally for a long time and just like one experience with someone just like, just like touching each other's hands for a second and yeah. like talking. My my friend, uh, my friend Jez one time, I, I see her very not often. We we grew up in Georgia together. She was like my first girlfriend when I was like five or something. <laughs> but uh, but she lives in New York. I, I see her every couple years, right? But she was out here one time and she does this thing. It's more for her um, like neurodivergence. It's like her stemming. It's just like something that grounds her. But she she was talking to me. We were like sitting at a bar and she was just pinching my, my elbow skin huh. while talking. And it was the most endearing, comforting, like yeah. looking in my eyes. We're having a full on conversation. And she just started like... Just playing with it's a really fun like part of the it's body a fun to play part because well. there's not nerves <laughs> on it, which is weird, but the skin moves, which gives you sensation. Yeah. It was the strangest, most intimate, grounding, like non-sexual, but like was like healing. It, yeah. it like put me in my body. And she was doing it to actually ground herself, but like it literally put me in my body and I was just I, I never forgot it. I was like, Jez, that is the weirdest and most enjoyable, like never stop. Yes. <laughs> Never stop. If we're talking, just play with my elbows. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And just like an affirming like touch on your shoulder.